I started taking music lessons when I was four, and at points in my career, I've practiced six or more hours on any given day. There are undoubtedly people you've heard of or seen who are self-taught at whatever has brought them success, but I can almost guarantee that they've spent hours studying their craft, learning the markets, and or honing their image. Along the way, however, I have learned that even when I practice a lot, I'm not prepared until I've tried out my concert in front of a friendly test audience, often of one. You'll find out some of the potential weak spots if you try out whatever you're about to do in front of someone. I try to do solo performances at least three times prior to the actual concert, starting with the most encouraging friend and working up to the friend who is probably the most critical. The operative word is friend. Nobody needs to have their confidence pulled down right before a concert. If this sounds too difficult, I recommend recording yourself. I do that anyway, usually before the first test performance. The thing is, you have to be able to critique without tearing yourself down, which is where the core work of self-acceptance comes in. You will probably find things to improve. What's that you said, Winston? Every day you make progress. Every step may be fruitful. Yet there will stretch out before you an ever-lengthening, ever-ascending, ever-improving path. You know you will never get to the end of the journey, but this, so far from discouraging, only adds to the joy and glory of the climb. This brings me to Julia Cameron's classic, The Artist's Way. One of her pieces of advice is that if it's worth doing something well, it's worth doing it badly until you get better at it. I can't think of anything that we humans learn to do that doesn't require a lot of repetition before we truly know what we're doing. How do we survive the misfires? That involves preparation, too, of a more internal kind. I will address that topic more fully in another segment. Time to take out your notebook again. What was your most embarrassing experience? Have you moved on, or does it still bother you? Can you reframe it as a learning experience? Write down a few notes about your feelings about this event and how it changed you, if that applies. Are you compassionate with yourself when you think about it? If not, can you think of one empathetic thing you can say to yourself about being imperfect in that moment? To this point, I've been dealing with the most traditional definition of performance, which involves being on a stage. But preparation still applies if you think it's scary to talk to people, or one special person. Another aside, I am an introvert. This isn't the same as having social anxiety, necessarily, but I am well acquainted with that, too. I used to hate going places by myself, and I used to spend a lot of time thinking people wouldn't like me. The thing is, some people don't. They don't like you, either. And you don't like them. It's all good. I believe we can and should be compassionate with others, realizing that bad behavior comes from insecurity. However, not every person gives us the vibes that draw us closer. I heard this in a movie or a TV show. I can't recall the name. 25% of people will like you for the wrong reasons. 25 will like you for the right reasons. 25% will dislike you for the wrong reasons. 25% will dislike you for the right reasons. It's only the last group you should worry about. Okay, hardly scientific, and I don't think worry is a good word to use if you are already prone to anxiety. But you get the idea. One more thing about worry. I generally go places by myself, or with my kids. Not because I have no friends, but because the complexity of life is easier to navigate if I don't need to adapt to someone else's schedule. There was a time I wasn't sure if I would be able to make small talk. Then I honestly stopped caring what people think about me. Not in an obnoxious way. I try to treat people with kindness and compassion. I also don't feel compelled to speak if I have nothing to say. But since I find people interesting, it's not hard to think of at least a sentence or two, if I'm so inclined. I realize that there are plenty of people who will find me quirky, or some such other term. But just as I don't feel compelled to talk to them, I don't think they should feel compelled to talk to me. When I was in elementary school, I invited all the popular kids to my birthday party, even though we barely knew each other. By high school, I decided I didn't have much in common with them. By the time I graduated, I was okay with that. 
I won't say I never felt needy thereafter, but the more I reminded myself that the only way to know if people are really my friends is by choosing to be authentic, even if that means revealing things they may not accept, the more friends I had. In other words, the less I cared whether people liked me or not, the more they seemed to like me. How did I do it? Many factors, but one that anyone can do, regardless of religious belief, is not to accept negative assessments from yourself or others as gospel. One more exercise for your journal. The next time you have an uncomfortable encounter with another person, write about it. Then let at least three days pass. Read your entry again. First, remember that you can't change anyone's behavior, only your own. Did you fall into a pattern with that person that feels familiar? Is there something you could do differently? Write in a journal, then read back what you wrote later when you have a bit more distance, and challenge your faulty thinking, identifying the things you could stand to change, and when you see yourself falling into old patterns, but not beating yourself up. Simply resolve to do better the next time. The more self-aware you are, the more you can break old habits with determination, persistence, and perhaps some divine assistance. Getting to this point has taken me years, but if I can do it, so can you. You may be wondering what all of this has to do with preparation or performing anxiety in general. Remember, I mentioned in another video that fear of embarrassment is the root of all performance anxiety. The best way to battle that is to learn to accept yourself. That's the long game, of course. I will give you some more immediate fixes in another segment. Anyway, I don't think there's anything wrong with coming up with a question or two to ask someone with whom you want to start a conversation. I mean, a question, not a pickup line. If you can't think of a question that isn't a pickup line, may I suggest that you aren't ready for a real relationship? Just like people who have taken two piano lessons probably aren't ready to solo with the New York Philharmonic. Note that the people who do solo with the New York Philharmonic have two piano lessons. Then they keep going. The main thing to remember is, if it doesn't work out, what's the worst that can happen? In fact, write the answer to that question in your journal. Get as elaborate as you want. This will be another opportunity to go back in a few days and see if you can come up with another ending to your story. Or two. Or three. Because there is almost never just one possible outcome of any given event. This may not seem like part of preparation, but I think it's perhaps the most important piece. Because no matter how gifted you are, no matter how much you've practiced, your attitude will affect your performance. If it seems like a matter of life and death, well, that's way too much pressure. The first solo recital I gave after several years hiatus happened the same day Nick Walenda walked across a tightrope somewhere or the other without a net, which probably helped to put my performance into perspective. At this point, you may be wondering if I'm trying to say, in the words of the immortal Freddie Mercury, that nothing really matters to me. That's from Bohemian Rhapsody, in case you aren't a fan. But how are you not a fan? I digress. Of course I care about doing a good job. I have high personal standards. And I realize that my livelihood depends on maintaining at least shouting distance to my best efforts. That said, I have learned that the best possible state I can be in is to know I have put in the work and just let the chips fall where they may. As in, just do what I'm doing with as much immersion as possible without judging it so much. I'll address this in more detail in another segment, but in the meantime, here's the story of my best audition ever, prefaced by the statement that I hate auditions, haven't had one in ages, and I don't miss the process at all. Action. So let me tell you about a peak experience of not having performance anxiety, and that was my doctoral piano audition. Um, I had decided to go into the doctoral program because basically I wasn't sure what I would do with a degree, even a master's in music performance from Juilliard. And so um, there's the avenue of becoming a performer and just trying to hustle, and then there's the other avenue of being able to be a professor. And so I just sort of said, well, 
if I get in, that means that I meant to do a doctorate. If I don't get in, then that means I wasn't. So as I prepared for this very difficult audition, I worked very hard, of course, and you know tried to be as ready as possible. But um, the thing that made the difference, I think, was that I was really prepared to let the chips fall where they may. In other words, I didn't have a firm investment in which way it would go. It was just like, okay, if this is meant to be, I'll get in. <laughs> if it's not meant to be, I won't. And as I said, I did practice a lot. But when I got there, my teacher was not present. Uh, he was away on a tour. So there was this room full of people I didn't really know very well. I mean, I knew who they were. They were very famous. But I didn't know them personally. And there was no particularly friendly face in the room. And I walked in. And then I discovered that I was about to be videotaped. And if you know anything about being videotaped, that means that people can play it back. Which means that even if they didn't hear mistakes the first time, they can hear the mistakes the second time. I didn't know who was going to listen to this video, but anyway, I was just sort of like, okay, whatever. And that was kind of the thing. If the whole experience was just, okay, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I didn't put any additional pressure on myself. I just said, okay, I'm here, I'm going to play. They'll like it, they won't like it. And so, um, one of the pieces that I played very famously, for those of you who are pianists, the Chopin Fourth Ballad, F minor, there's a section at the end where it gets very quiet, and then all heck breaks loose. And so, um, this particular person asked me to cut to that part, in other words, stop in the middle, because they didn't have time to hear the whole piece, and then just start at the really hard part, the coda at the end. And so um, then someone else stopped him from doing that. But honestly, I was ready to do it. You know, I just, I was playing hard pieces. I was like hitting all the notes. Everything was just working. And I walked out and I was like, wow, I was in such a zone. Now, how did I get into that zone? Because I haven't been able to consistently get back into that zone. The thing that made the difference was just A, preparing, and B, walking in with the sense of, these people will like it, they won't like it. I'll get in, I won't get in. But either way, the world won't end. I'm gonna just go in, I'm gonna just play, I'm gonna give it my all, and I'm not gonna have anything else on my mind besides just, here I am, I'm playing, it'll be over soon, and I'm just, I'm just here, I'm just gonna do it. So that's an experience that hopefully every person can have. But part of it is that mindset. Now, I won't say that I was able to stay in that mindset, after that, I won't say that, you know, it isn't something that I don't still sometimes have to work on, just that whole thing of letting go of the idea that everything is so super important that if it doesn't work out perfectly, then the sky will fall, the earth will end, or whatever, you know, just making it a bigger deal than it is. Now, is it a big deal to get into a doctoral program? Sure, it was a big deal in the sense, but if I hadn't got into that one, which was the only one I auditioned for, which was kind of stupid, but anyway, if I hadn't gotten in that day, I could have auditioned somewhere else another day. Or I could have decided to do something else. Or I could have just focused more on, okay, well, I'm maybe not going to focus on the um, university track, I'll focus on something else. The point is, whatever happened next was something that could have been dealt with. You know, it didn't have to be, oh, I got in and then, you know, my life is made. So I think that's an important lesson, an important lesson that I didn't really learn on that day. But knowing that I was able to do that means that I knew I could do it again. And that is another important thing to take with you. Anytime something happens and you are less nervous, that means that being less nervous is possible. A final word about preparing. You can't be too prepared, but you also can't control everything just because you're prepared. If that statement makes you nervous, the next segment is for you.